Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think um, actually the content of this talk, in a lot of ways, it's uh, technically yeah, pretty basic in the sense that it's uh, stuff that is uh, in, in the know among a lot of people already, but it's uh, basically just some uh, I think reminders of some uh, differences between the way that I've seen people talking about consensus, uh, definitely kind of in the broader world, though, uh, you know, to, to some extent among researchers that are kind of so somewhat further from practice versus the kinds of uh, concerns that like would like actually prevent, like, for example, Ethereum in its current form from uh, improving things like its uh, scalability or its security. Uh, so... There are one of the big uh, kind of categories of uh, misconceptions that I see is uh, basically yeah, the role of consensus algorithms in optimizing uh, what people call scalability and specifically transactions per second, right? So there's two separate variables that's uh, important to keep in mind here, right? One is scalability, which is the yeah, number of transactions that you can process per second. And the second is latency, which is uh, basically how many milliseconds or seconds or, or minutes it takes to either confirm a yeah, transaction or finalize a transaction. Like basically, that's ideally the time delta between you sending a transaction and that transaction actually yeah, getting included on chain, right? So those two are different. And uh, I think it's important to, to, to remember that like consensus algorithms can do the uh, first they can, or they could do latency reduction, but consensus algorithms are really not what's actually going to get you to high levels of scalability. This is uh, something that like one way to, I think, prove that it's a yeah, really common and important misconception is to, um, you know, ask the bot that has been fed the uh, total sum of the human internet up until September 2021 and, uh, you know, see what the bot thinks, right? And so if you ask the bot, you know, how does the consensus algorithm use at a public blockchain affect this TPS? Uh, you know, you get uh, these four answers where one, proof of work is slow because miners have to solve complex mathematical problems. Um, so basically an assumption that proof of work mining competes with the uh, computing that's needed to verify blocks. Um, second is block time, the time needed to confirm a block, uh, which is uh, 10 minutes in Bitcoin. Uh, three, scalability. Uh, so uh, proof of work has limited scalability because adding more nodes does not increase the, the speed at which blocks are added or I guess the number of transactions that each block processes. And four, forking, proof of work can result in forks, right? Now, if you had to like grade this answer, it'd probably give it a one, maybe 1. 1.5 out of four, right? Like the proof of work argument is... Uh, basically completely false because uh, big, you know the hardware that does the mining is totally separate from the hardware that that does the verifying right you know you do the verifying on a CP on basically a CPU ver the mining is done on you know, like either GPUs or ASICs that are connected to the hardware that does the node running uh, block time also I'd say yeah mark this one incorrect because uh, block time and uh, scalability are fair, are quite disconnected. If you just uh, tweak Bitcoin and uh, replace the parameter that says 600 with a parameter that says 60, you're in order to keep the system roughly equally safe, you're like actually going to have to uh, pretty much decrease the maximum block size by a factor of 10. Um, Scalability, I think it's, uh, you know, I want to give this one a 0 0.5 out of one just uh, because, uh, you know, adding more nodes does, like, it is, uh, or sorry, scale, right, 0 0.5 out of one because uh, even though scalability, yeah, mm, you know, can be improved by yeah, things like sharding, and I think it's reasonable to interpret this sentence by as being as basically stating that Proof of work, as people generally think about it, does not include charting. And so more nodes doesn't increase the amount of stuff that happens. But it's like still kind of stretching it to like really associate this with proof of work, right? And then forking proof of work can result in forks. And as I'll talk about later, security issues associated with the possibility of forking. This is uh, 
something that I think is uh, actually correct, right? So it's good to give one out of one here, right? So, you know, one out of 1.5 out of four in total, which is uh, not a very good score, right? So what's true in practice, as I mentioned, consensus algorithms can give you lower latency. Um, though, if a lot of the really extreme uh, impressive numbers that you get sometimes, they always depend not just on consensus algorithm design, they do depend on centralization, right? So like if you want to optimize the latency academically, what you'd probably do is you'd probably use one of those fancy protocols that gives you one round uh, you know, finality at the cost of having a one over seven uh, you know, like safety threshold or, what, um, or whatever. But like, that's not what they do, right? What they do is they have a, a small number of nodes that are in um, you know, VPSs that are closely connected to each other, uh, but the, um, like sometimes even co-located and they basically yeah, just completely sacrifice you know, like resilience and other, and other things, right? But even still, you know, proof of work and, uh, BF and BFT are like actually different and that's a consensus algorithm difference. Consensus algorithms are not the key to scale, right? So the reason why is basically that you can conceptually separate things into consensus overhead and broadcasting and verification overhead, right? So the first is the overhead involved in the consensus process. And the second is just uh, getting all of the data to everyone and uh, people you know, validating signatures on transactions, computing state transitions and those kinds of things. And uh, basically all um, you know, like modern blockchains, they group transactions into blocks and grouping transits into blocks means that these two are separate, right? Because an unlimited number of transactions can be represented by one block. You can optimize consensus overhead down to near zero, but not further, right? Eventually you get to the point where like basically all of your overhead has to do with broadcasting and verification. Now you might say, and to be fair, lots of uh, people and, paper, and, and lots of papers have said, aha, uh -huh. well, actually, you know, you can go up to 100% efficiency in the sense that you can make an algorithm that allows nodes to spend 100% of the time verifying blocks. But actually, proof of work and um, like lots of other things have various weaknesses and efficiencies that mean that like in practice, it's not actually safe to exceed nodes running maybe 5% of the time. Right. So there are known results about proof of work that go all the way back to um, you know, 2013 and, uh, and 2012 and some early Bitcoin scaling discussions. Um, I think it was like uh, Decker and Wattenhofer, I believe, had a paper on this uh, way back then. There's, but, you know, it was also kind of Internet forum lore that uh, fault tolerance decreases when verific block verification time as a fraction of the block interval is significant. Right. And uh, basically the argument here is that if uh, there is a time delay between a proof of work solution being discovered and a block being published, then another proof of work solution might get discovered during the uh, time during which that block is getting broadcasted and verified if that block ends up competing with the, uh, the original block. Um, so because of this uh, blockchains where you try to like really crank up the uh, scaling, end up having what, what we yeah, in Ethereum will call it an uncle rate, right? A yeah, rate of uh, basically, yeah, you know, blocks that have the yeah, kind of, that are descended from the same block, but that are not like directly parents or children of each other. And uncles do not contribute to scalability. And uh, they also um, actually yeah, sacrifice on uh, scalability because clients have to waste time verifying both of uh, sets of uh, transactions, but only one contributes to the act actual chain. And to be fair, pre-2020, this actually was the, a bottleneck for Ethereum, right? In many cases, even the primary bottleneck. There were periods of time during which with the yeah, uncle rated Ethereum got up to like over 10%, even sometimes over 20%. Um, and there were fears of uh, denial of service attacks from adversarial transactions, right? So on average, blocks in Ethereum would take, you know, 300, maybe 500 milliseconds to verify. But there were fears of these denial of service attacks where if you craft a maximally, uh, you know, optimized to be evil transaction that consumes all of the uh, operations that are just accidentally underpriced, then those transactions could take a very long time to verify. And there were some pretty nasty results back then. Like there was a result that showed that it was uh, 
you could make it take a block that takes 80 seconds to verify. And uh, during the 2016 uh, Shanghai DOS attacks, people actually did, right? Now, of course, uh, so to some extent, right, um, you know, it gets uh, fair to take, think about this, but also to another extent, it's like, even if Ethereum had done fancy stuff like Bitcoin NG, that would have uh, changed the proof of work so that you theoretically could spend, um, you know, like 80 or 90% of uh, block time doing the proof of work. You would, we would not have actually been able to take advantage of that because we would have still needed a safety factor anyway to deal with denial of service attacks, right? Now, post 2020, uh, denial of service attacks are actually uh, not really an issue because they've all been successfully fixed. And, um, you know, some heroic work by, uh, you know, Peter Solagi, Martin Svendo, all kinds of Geth developers and uh, other people in actually like implementing the uh, fixes of that. Uh, they have uh, been identified to a lot of those uh, problems. So Ethereum is uh, in a much better position in terms of DOS than it was before. But the main concern now is actually nothing about computation. The main concern is uh, state size and sync time, right? So state size, right? So th we did this poll uh, just, uh, this is uh, in an informal poll inside of the research team. Basically, yeah, on the computer you're using to answer it right now, um, you know, how many uh, gigabytes do you have? And people, most people have less than one terabyte, right? And so there's a lot of this kind of discourse on the internet that's like, oh, at 50 terabyte states are trivial because you look, you can go buy this other hard disk on Amazon and, um, you know, it's uh, actually super cheap. But the reality is like most people don't have these. And if you want to have a uh, an algorithm where, you know, regular people run nodes, which is like basically a requirement for a, de a decentralization, you can't really rely on that, right? And you have to like basically deal with the uh, hardware that people have. Another uh, corollary of this is initial sync time, the amount of time it takes to join the network for the first time. This is uh, a big bottleneck for uh, decentralization as well, right? If you have a protocol where it take a node is on average actively verifying blocks 50% of the time, then if you want a node to sync from uh, Genesis, if the chain has been running for five years, it'll take five years for a newly syncing node to catch up, right? Uh, so, and then even if you do fast sync, I um, mean, you, know, you still it's still proportional, and uh, sync time still, I um, mean, you know, keeps going up and keep and uh, keeps going up, right? And the yeah, there have recently been um, advancements, and again, I mean, I have to like really give credit to client developers here that really have uh, decreased sync time a lot. And I believe I saw a statistic that like Ref can do it in a couple of days, but like this is totally not consensus side work, right? Uh, and even still, um, you know, there's problems with uh, history storage, uh, making sure that, um, you know, like history can be stored in a uh, decentralized way. And just all of these kind of secondary externalities that have to do with the blockchain being bigger that are not about the core thing of nodes, um, you know, like have, being able to, run verification like 10% of the time instead of 5% of the time. Another really fun one is uh, interaction effect. Uh, so specifically interaction effects between state size and uh, transaction throughput. Basically when the state gets bigger, each individual transaction gets slower to process. And uh, you can, this is uh, just a pretty obvious uh, kind of analog N effect, right? Each access takes a logarithmic time. And, but Actually, logarithmic really understates the scale of the problem because the top half of the tree is in RAM, right? And so the thing that you're really taking the logarithm of, the thing that is um, actually uh, you know, a significant cost is uh, disk state divided by RAM size, right? So if the uh, disk state is 64 gigs and the RAM size is 4 gigs, then you have a factor of 16 that you need to represent in the tree. Now, if that blockchain uh, becomes uh, you know, another 16 times more scalable, then the 64 gigs on disk turns into 1,024 gigs on disk. And then the factor here, um, instead of uh, being a factor of 16, is actually going to be a factor of 256. And so a 4x increase in scale actually means an 8x increase in uh, transaction uh, or, or um, like cost of uh, verifying transactions, right? So there's like all of these 
various complicated effects that make it difficult to just uh, you know say okay you can just uh, just like bump up the numbers because uh, you know the stats say that you can right because the stats that you have on even per transaction processing are different when you have few transactions than when you have many transactions. Um, is sharding a consensus algorithm, right? So a lot of problems do in fact get solved by sharding. And I think here the, the, the distinction is like more linguistic than anything else, right? To me, sharding is not a consensus algorithm. To me, sharding is a verification strategy, right? So the... Um, what you can still do this uh, kind of separation between consensus logic and execution logic. And if within the context of that separation, sharding is uh, part, like it, you can describe it as being part of execution. You could also describe it as being part of uh, being a combination of uh, ZK snark proving and verification and data availability verification. But whatever it is, it's like stuff that happens off to the side that is uh, separate from consensus logic, right? But this is like my view and this is my design philosophy. There are other people like uh, Vlad Zamfir who are big fans of paradigms that mix consensus and sharding much more, right? And they really like the idea of these fancy consensus designs where you actually do have like hundreds of blocks that being proposed in parallel where each block actually contains different transactions that are associated with different regions of the state. And you have really complicated cross-linking schemes that affect the fork choice. Right, so I personally don't really get yeah, to that direction, but other remote researchers do. So if you want to make sure to get consensus algorithm, you can, but like really it, it totally does not need to be. Um, so thresholds, right? Theory versus practice. So theory, the most important thing is the difference between different thresholds, right? Is your safety threat or liveness threshold 20%, 33%, 49%? <laughs> the practice is, I think that at least as important as these thresholds are the finer details that determine whether or not a single actor actually reaches that threshold, right? So what's more secure? A blockchain where the safety threshold is 20%, but where no single actor has more than 1% uh, of the yeah, consent, of the weight in the consensus, or a blockchain where the safety threshold is 49%, but like two people together have 63% between the two of them, right? I'd rather trust. Uh, trust the first, then the second. And there's a lot of uh, things that are in the second that have to do with consensus algorithm design, right? You know, some of it is like the technical parts of design and, uh, you know, the stuff that actually goes into the papers, but some of it is uh, also from things that are somewhat outside and it's a complicated uh, combination of both. I think in general, centralization is... Uh, has been so far very hard to uh, like formally model or formally reason about in any way. And uh, because it's clearly the frontier of uh, current difficulties, I think it's uh, valuable to try to do more of that kind of work. Uh, so centralization risks can come from uh, validator economics. Um, they, so, you know, is it cheap, like two X more expensive to run a node that uh, has a uh, a 2x larger share of the yeah, consensus, or is it less than 2x more expensive, right? Realistically, it cannot be more than 2x more expensive, because if it is, then you can just split your node in half and run the two sides separately. But if it's uh, less than 2x more expensive, then um, you know like that creates economies of scale, and that leads to centralization. Um, misuse of restaking is um, a centralization risk, right? So if you have a consensus algorithm, and then other things, context of ethereum but like there are protocols in bitcoin that i'm like concerned about right so drive chains is probably a big reason here right or a big a big example like one megabyte or four megabytes or whatever but then you have these separate chains that miners opt into validating that are much larger right and so time like from a yeah, user validation perspective like it changes this unless you're willing to give users the responsibility to like as in which case it is a block size trade-off where it basically the de facto security of the system instead of just being about um or
right? Um, so the restaking did create centralization risks. Um, in addition to that, um, or all of these kind of, uh, especially these like very high load protocols can uh, create blockchain uh, splitting risks. So I do think that there's a lot of value that can come from uh, restaking and uh, you know, like especially just this concept of like uh, validators being able to opt in to you know like also being nodes of uh, other protocols. But I think it just uh, you know as I've uh, talked about in my blog, it needs to be approached carefully. And then difficulty of running a node, right? Um, so like I've pulled and asked people, you know, why you don't if you don't stake all your ETH today as a solo staker, why don't you? And uh, just technical difficulty of running a staking node is uh, a big part of it. Some of it is just needing to have separate hardware, block, uh, just block validation being expensive. Um, th some of it um, has to do with safety, right? If you're staking a lot of ETH, you really don't want it to be in one place. And now we have DVT, distributed validator technology, but like that needs to like really be improved more. So you know, things like this can cause centralization risks and it's really important to mitigate them. Um, time to finality. Uh, so Ethereum, in theory, finalizes in 12.18 to 19 minutes. And in practice, though, most people set shorter finality times, pretending that it's basically fine after some number of confirmations, right? I actually, you know, I, I'm sure they exist, but I haven't personally seen a service that like actually, yeah, you know, gives you the confirmation that you expect in uh, 12.8 to 18 minutes. It always seems to be either less or more, right? And I think one of my conclusions here is like finality time is convex, right? That like there's a less value than I thought a few years ago in trying to have this medium level of finality time, right? I think uh, there is more value in like either pushing the finality time to drop under a minute or just like letting the finality time increase to a few hours and, uh, you know, basically having it line up to the yeah, sort of human finality time of, uh, you know, verifying that there hasn't been some bug in the protocol or whatever. Right. So, you know, either pick one side or, um, or, pick, uh, or pick the other side. And, uh, you know, I think under a minute, it starts uh, becoming more convex. Right. But like the, yeah, once you go above it, then, uh, you know, theoretical finality and practical finality start diverging from each other. And so it becomes, you know, like less clear what some of the benefits are. Right. So, yeah, that was, uh, you know, what I what I wanted to share, like basically, yeah, you know, just uh, some of the you know, kind of practical reasons why, yeah, sort of there's differences between the numbers that you can get for things like scalability and safety on paper and the yeah, the numbers that you can get for these things in practice. And like, it's always good to, you know, ask to and talk and actually, you know, talk to become friends with the core devs and like actually see, you know, like what are the marginal concerns stopping chains from uh, you know, like becoming better than they are.